We are back on the making of a marketer. Happy Friday to you all. Just Nickerson, Andy Pondillo here back in our Zoom studios. So uh, just, you know, I'm hype right now. It's the end of the week. It's been a solid week. And if you're watching on the video, I got my Bucky shirt right here. So um, just, I, I always got to leave with a little bit of a surprise. Are you familiar with Bucky's? Because for whatever reason, that's in my head. Big news this week. It's coming to Ohio. It's getting closer to Pittsburgh. So we have to celebrate. I I am actually familiar with this grocery store thanks or via my Disney vloggers because now that's a thing where they've been going to this grocery store and rating all the food at the Bucky's. And it 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 looks very good and it's very expansive. So it's even more than just the groceries, though. So they have their own food, they make their own brisket breakfast tacos they have 200 gas pumps they have at one of them the world's longest car wash bucky shows up in costume there's gift shops like i love you mentioned disney because it is basically if disney built a gas station this is what they would do except it's a beaver versus mickey mouse Okay, now I'm starting to understand why they would go to this grocery store as, as part of their, their their content creation plan. Makes sense. So, and then we do talk about marketing. So I just had to explain the shirt I had on today because people are going to be watching this for me. Like, if they don't know what Bucky's is, they're like, well, what is Andy wearing today? This is their mascot, the beaver. Part of their marketing is they sell a seasonal shirt. So this was their New Year's shirt that glows in the dark and they're just dropping their Halloween stuff now. So uh, I'll be picking that up as well. So Andy, what is your like preferred food at Bucky's? So the classics, the beaver nuggets, like if you want some sweet food, but it's kind of, that it's like too sweet. It's kind of that kind of makes like the side of your mouth numb um, if you eat too many of them, but I like their brisket a lot. So um, whatever they put it on sandwiches, they do it with tacos. So uh, any of their barbecue meats are, are wonderful there. And for anyone that has not heard of Bucky's, you, I think you do need to explain what these beaver nuggets are. Yes. So they're kind of like, they're these nuggets full of sugar. And they're like this, you know, like somewhat big. Um, imagine like Honey Smack cereal, but built like into a full-size nugget versus a cereal. And it's just like eating a bunch of sugar all at once. That's like their signature thing they started with. Wow. It's a, it's a Texas thing, but people are starting to see it, you know, further out now. So uh, leading with Bucky's, I got more on that later. Like, I think we need to have a Bucky show, but we do have an important show at hand today. And we have two guests for the first time ever, Jess. We're doing the four-person program. Uh, we're introducing uh, one of our favorites and then also... Um, another person from our friends at Stokes. So we have the senior directors, Josh Ruff, and you may remember Marcus Hollinger, um, both from Stokes joining the program. We're going to actually talk today in our summer series about constructing a program or product and what does that look like? How does something get from A to Z? And we're really excited to jump into the minds uh, of both of these guests. So very happy to have you both, Josh and Marcus, today. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Jess. Good to see you both. And we're um, excited to hang out with you this afternoon. So, Marcus, you already know this question because we've asked you before. So I'm going to task Josh with you yeah. first. Um, and it's talking about creativity. So before we jump into what you're doing at Stoke, I want to ask, you know, we talk about creativity a lot on this program. We talk about getting stuck, unstuck. How do you look at creativity when you're stuck and how do you get unstuck from that from your day to day? Yeah. Um, okay. For me, it is a, a little play assessment. And I ask, have I had fun lately? Um, have I played around with this lately? And uh, if I can look and see maybe multiple days or weeks have gone by and I haven't had fun or played a little bit, it helps me snap out of it. Um, and every time I tap into play, it pushes me to think um, a little differently or a little more radically. Uh, but I think the, the power behind it is it frees me up to care a little less about failure uh, and be open to use failure to learn something new rather than be kind of demoralized by it. 
I love that. And, and that's something that I think that we try to test all the time. You know, we test doing this, like, are we, you know, Jess and I trying to have fun on this podcast, you know, loosen it up a little bit, talk about some ideas and uh, Marcus tuning it to you. I think that's something that we really hit on our episode uh, last time and how your brain works creatively. Uh, definitely curious, you know, your thoughts, you know, we've asked you this question before, but, you know, maybe just a rehash for our first time listeners, how they've gone about how you go about trying to get unstuck. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know if it'd be a rehash, but probably an update. What I've been toying with lately is um, finding metaphors. So right now I'm super, super, super into the world of hospitality and um, it, particularly how it shows up in the restaurant industry. And I have been just finding a well of inspiration through the show The Bear and the accompanying book, Unreasonable Hospitality. And I mean, I'm just lit up. I'm ready to start cooking and trying new recipes. And I'm just reminded that by exploring an industry that's not my own, and uh, you know, I've never worked in hospitality, um, I'm reminded that by seeking out those like metaphors or analogous uh, industries, that there's so many different ways to find new creative material, new perspective, new ways of going about things. Can I say this explains a little tagline Marcus has added on? Whenever we're getting momentum, he'll send us a note. Are we cooking? We're cooking. So now I know where this is coming from, Marcus. Yes, chef. <laughs> I love it. So let's let's talk about stoked and we're excited to bring idea science to the table and before the show uh marcus josh we were talking a little bit about this is the first time you've really talked about it outside of the door so um i guess we'll start with you marcus let's talk about idea science what is it why did you you create it and also just talk about let's combine it a little bit with what both of you are doing at stoked and, and what you're trying to achieve with this new launch yeah. Um, so Idea Science is essentially a three hour program that is designed to help creators and innovators tap into their creativity to make accessible the science behind creativity and make it experiential. And I feel I want I would love to get into some of the other questions, but I got to bounce that over to my man, Josh, to to speak a little bit as to add some color like, Josh, what are, what are we doing? What are we bringing people? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Marcus. I it takes me back to I mean, at Stoked, we lead human centered design programs, whether it's educating teams um, on how to apply human centered um, exploration to whatever problem they're exploring. It's educating um, it's leading innovation programs, uncharted territory with teams, and it's also culture work, kind of assessing the headwinds and tailwinds in a team culture and exploring what rituals or behaviors we can establish to um, create a space to routinely innovate. Um, so as we've been doing these programs, we keep seeing this hump that happens when we're switching from problem finding to problem solving. Um, in the problem finding mode, we're asking people to suspend jumping to conclusions, or um, I guess that's delayed in it, delayed intuition um, that comes to us from Daniel Kahneman. Uh, and then we say, okay, now it's time for ideas. Let's brainstorm and generate a lot. Um, we keep sensing this hump that happens like, oh, I have permission to explore. Um, and there's a lot of stereotypes that come around ideation, like let's crack the Red Bull and crank the music or open our umbrellas. It's about to be a brainstorm. And we're trying to challenge a lot of um, those assumptions or stereotypes and explore this huge suite of tools that help us generate ideas. Some of them are pretty counterintuitive. So we felt like a three hour program or space is like the right size to go deep in many different tools to help us explore a variety of options or solutions. So that's really why we're pushing into or leaning into this concept of idea generation. 
And I just have to quickly jump in with this idea around exploring the science behind it, because what I think you're doing, too, is also demystifying the the stereotype that I'm not in a creative profession, so I'm not creative. So I love it. Yes, our hope is that by talking a little bit about what's going on inside your brain, it gives people permission to be like, oh, yeah. There's a cliche that says like everyone's creative and you can tap into it, but we want to show like what's actually happening. Does that convince me that it's worth putting in the effort, doing something a little counterintuitive or a little wacky um, to dive to dive into that space? So let's talk about just the discovery of, of figuring out we are creative. You know, I used to say in my 20s when I was a radio host that I would come up with my bits um, that I would do on the show at like 1 a.m. in the morning the night before. Uh, that's not something that I really encourage or do very much of anymore. But I do think there was some power to that that I've tried to rediscover a little bit later in my career that I sometimes will come up with, you know, creative elements or these kind of off the wall things at the most random moments. And I, and I really like what Marcus hit on earlier in this podcast. Sometimes it comes from completely different industries. An example I'll give you is a lot of times when I teach like B2B marketing at LinkedIn and whatnot, I'm pulling ideation and strategy actually from the hospitality market. I, people ask, like, who, do, who should I look at to develop a strategy? I tell you all the time, MGM Resorts. It's where 50% of my ideation comes from. I'll tell you that right now. I, t I use a lot of what they do in, in my stuff, but just kind of the roundabout point is so much of this, I think, is trying to figure out your creative skill set. So there's kind of a customization that to each person. So it sounds like what you're doing in this three hour session, it sounds like you're almost unlocking what that is for the individual. Yes. Um, the first assumption is ideation is for extroverts. Say it out loud, throw it out there. We're actually introducing tools that we literally call introvert brainstorm tools. Um, also, there is an assumption that ideation happens best in the confines of a workshop, in a brainstorm with a bunch of people, um, but there's solo idea generation that is incredibly valuable for exploring really new territory. All of these new directions um, might be a little counterintuitive, and we're trying to really help people just get exposure to, I've been exploring maybe in a routine way. Um, and there's some new tools that might be fit for me if I don't think I qualify um, for maybe the standard standard list of what makes a creative person. So let's talk about developing a program. So there is a lot that goes into this, and, and I definitely want to hit on kind of, Josh, both your creative side and maybe your marketing side to this. Like, what is it that goes into like where what is point a because there's somebody out here that's likely you know working at a company thinks they have an idea they want to try to get the idea to the finish line but there's a lot of steps in between to get there yeah um i think this is so good um you guys are asking the right questions like i'm juiced um uh, i think that the point a really i think starts with trying to identify a problem or a problem within a problem. So I think it, it's always helpful to figure out like, is there, is there, are people around me suffering? Are people around me like stuck on something? And can I go get near to that? And then figure out like, okay, what's a way to, what's, what are some ways I can kind of throw some potential solutions at this in like a small scale type of way? And I like the concept of a problem within a problem because that's actually kind of how idea science came about. So we are by trade knee deep in the problem of helping people become more human and more innovative at work. And what we found is there's sort of a micro problem around people being able to sort of, once they've kind of accepted the premise that anyone can be creative, there's sort of a, a, a micro problem of getting people to kind of easily onboard into the doing or to embracing some of the wacky behaviors that Josh sort of talked about. So right there, there was just a glaring opportunity to experiment with, okay, what are some ways that we can reduce some of that friction 
And Josh was kind of first to try something out, to kind of try a guided meditation um, to as a as a potential solution. And it was a hit. Like it was it was my first time, you know, or one of the first Josh and I were collaborating on a project. I didn't quite know what was going on, but then he pulls the, you know, he pulls the curtain back and we're we're all in this experience and it's incredibly transformational. And from there, there was sort of this like, hey, within the problem that we were already working on, something happened and there may be opportunity to even go further in sort of expanding the impact of that solution to that problem. Um, so that, that's, I think, point A problem. Um, yeah, that, that's probably the simplest way to say it. And when you started developing this, were you thinking anything in terms of like target audience? Like, so once we start, you know, putting this on the market, who will this be for? Why will it be important to them? And was there any kind of like ways you finessed it once the idea came about? Yeah. Uh, for us, our, our target market is teams that have been trying to solve the same problem and have not gotten anywhere with it. Um, it is, hey, part of our core business is doing this thing brilliantly well, and we're making incremental progress, but we still haven't broken through. Um, and that tells us it's someone who's quite familiar with the challenge that they're setting out to solve, but they need to bring a new approach, a new energy, uh, or new skills or tools to how they attack that particular challenge. And, um, it kind of what you were tapping into, Marcus, this idea of like, wait a minute, what does meditation have to do with brainstorming or ideation um, kind of shows us what we learned. Like we were introduced to our target audience by running programs with teams and seeing folks that were experiencing this blocker. And we felt like this is our crew that we need to be solving for. There's actually... Uh, we believe a better solution out there than what we have been doing. Let's get really specific on naming what that is. Um, we had some seeds out there to see like something about this is working, uh, but how do we make it more relatable? Um, and I think we kind of had a special moment, Marcus, where we realized like, oh, we can link the science behind what's happening here to some sort of pop culture, uh, pop culture reference or phenomenon. The connection that worked surprisingly well was linking it to music artists and some phenomenon that happens in their creative process. Um, if now's a good time, I might uh, might showcase the connection here between what does um, what does uh, meditation have to do with brainstorming? What do you guys think? Should we dive in? Okay, go cool. for it. Um, okay, so idea science unfolds in four parts, and the first part on the topic of uh, musical artist is Willie Nelson. And what we learned is Willie Nelson wrote three of his greatest songs with 105 degree fever in one day. We were perplexed by this factoid and learned that what's actually happening is um, in this febrile state of lucid or fantastical thoughts, he's in a, a state of theta brainwave activity. It's brought on by this fever space. Um, we often hear the term fever dreams of wild creative thoughts. Um, what we actually learned, this comes to us from uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Um, he kind of unveiled this state of theta brainwave activity. We can actually access through guided meditation, visualization, and sound baths. And what happens is we have this really deep state of rest for our body, but a heightened exploratory space in our head that allows us to suspend um, the analytical part of our brain, which is always judging the ideas before we even give them a chance and dive into more fantastical thinking and exploration. And so the first phase of idea science is actually embracing some provisioning around guided meditation and sound bath experience so that we can quiet our inner critic, um, name the critic and maybe love the critic, but just turn the volume down a little bit um, to open ourselves up to what could be. Um, and that link of connecting a, an accessible 
factoid that's memorable and fun to the science, to the action um, is something that has really uh, given teams permission to dive into something that might otherwise seem um, uh, a little different or a little out there, um, if I use the words directly from some of our clients. <laughs> So one thing I like about this, Jess, and we're very much into the workshopping space, what we do in our, our daily lives, but I'll admit sometimes I'll go into these and I'm thinking about, you know, hey, if we made this like little switch on a creative piece or if we changed a tagline and try to work within the constraints uh, of what the campaigns are, sometimes I, I, I go back and I'm like, maybe I should just ask is this really what you want to do or what do you really want to do? And sometimes you got to take it to kind of this like big picture lens. So I think it's, you know, what we're hearing today, just is actually kind of important for us to think about too, because, you know, there are times we can make little tweaks and suggestions and things here, but it's not getting the marketer's passion all the way out there. And I feel when people are doing passionate work, they also do some of the, be the best return on investment work as well. Absolutely. And uh, what I love about this, and speaking of cultural references, for those of you that have seen Mad Men, this is very applicable to our marketers out there. Josh had not, and I had to tell him that, uh, I guess this is a little bit of a spoiler. So if you've not seen Mad Men and you're planning on watching Mad Men, then just a uh, hit pause or hit mute right now for a few minutes but uh, like the the major wrap up of the show of this very famous advertiser named Don Draper is finding his creativity or unlocking his creative potential at a silent retreat so he was doing guided meditation when uh the the idea of the the classic 1977 Coca-Cola commercial pops into his head uh, so you're obviously going deeper and talking more about the science behind like how a sound bath, how a, a guided meditation can really help you come up with those ideas. But I, I think this is perfect for marketers and for many people in the, the corporate space that are really looking to, as you say, break through and, and get unstuck. Mm. Andy, as you mentioned, passion, um, some I think the build here is like, sometimes we need permission to get passionate, ramp up how we feel about something. And it's kind of impossible to do that when we're slamming into a brainstorming meeting right after a meeting before that on budget forecasting, right after a meeting before that on scheduling. Um, what is also unique about this is just protected space for some stillness embracing stillness to just quiet the the monkey energy or the monkey mind that comes from what was happening before to get into that space and remind yourself oh i am passionate about this i do care about this can i just sit in that for a minute before i get into um this creative or before i do the creative click in definitely mm -hmm. and it's, it's something that just to tack on there a little bit i think for leaders who may have trouble kind of connecting with their creative side or who may struggle to answer that question, am I creative or not? I think that's the kind of the intentionality in connecting some of these uh, pop culture references. It's almost, it's, there's a work of demystification or decoding. When we think about folks like, you know, uh, a Willie Nelson or a Kendrick Lamar or someone like Rick Rubin, who sort of enshrined himself as like the creative executive. What makes this work exciting is that we're basically saying like, hey, we want to take what they're practicing every day and sort of back you into it and give you permission to take up that same that same work and go pursue, right? We're not like guaranteeing, but go pursue similar results in whatever wherever your arena is you know and this like brings something up too that that it, i feel like i've just listening to both of you i feel like i gotta write an article because something that i used to do and it was just kind of like a fun thing for me is i used to analyze marketing through uh, musicians and through pop culture so i've written an article about 
um, how I would have marketed Firefest and made it work. Um, I've done something where I've analyzed DJ Khaled and I taught like a little mini course on like what his strategy is for social media, but I haven't done this kind of stuff in a while. So I, I like that you're bringing it to the table. It almost reminds me because I did that and it was almost just like a writing practice. So when I was done with it, I'm not about to go do Firefest or be Billy McFarlane, but there were some things I wrote about. I was like, you know what? I should bring that to the table. That was a, a good idea. Oh, man. What we're trying to really lean into is um, uh, assessing what we're actually interested in just as humans and paying attention to that and exploring uh, why do I feel motivated to explore this idea or chase this down? Um, the very first time we uh, tested out the, the connection of a music artist, um, we can learn something from them to, to shape the way we approach this, was working with a team um, with a lot of experts in the room. And what we learned is like their expertise is getting in the way of breakthrough territory. Um, and uh, I, I think... Gosh, it was maybe a an article or a podcast I heard the week prior, where I learned that um, the Talking Heads, uh, do you know the song "This Must Be the Place"? Number two song in their entire collection. Um, Marcus uncovered that this was in the top two, uh, the Pitchfork top two hundred rock songs of the eighties. Um, that that song has a parenthetical subtitle, which is "Naive Melody." And the way that it earned that subtitle is because the way they wrote this, everyone switched instruments. David Byrne all of a sudden is behind a synthesizer. Uh, if you had drumsticks in your hand, now you've got this guitar slung around your neck. Um, so exploring by putting your expertise aside and getting into a space where this is like maybe a little foreign in brand new territory um, or naive, if you will, um, it can dramatically push your thinking and help you find breakthrough. Um, so that was the first time we said, hey, let's just weave this bit in and see how teams react to it. And we could feel like a palpable shift in the room of folks putting their expertise aside, embracing a different space and exploring some really bold new territory that broke, broke through from a lot of the ordinary solutions we were, we were expecting and seeing in the room. So let's talk about the customer base. Um, now you you've got a great product. You're you've you've tested it a little bit. You know you've gone through all this internal uh, discussion on on what this is going to look like. What do you say the secret is now to have not only a customer base that that joins but sticks with you? And, and you know I think about this through a marketing lens. The first thing I'm thinking about as you talk this through is how do you get somebody that that attends the program in markets for you almost like a UGC play do you, do you have a strategy in place or is this going to be something where you're going to almost beta test it and go from there great great question and suggestion right like it's like oh we got to you know take care of the UGC uh space and, and we we talked about this on when I was with you all last time and I think what we want, where we're starting, at least is in building community. So one of the things that we are putting together, we're, we're, before we actually go to market, we're putting together a council that is going to be our immediate community. And that will give us the opportunity to test some more, but then also each of these people, it, they're, they're, they've got diverse backgrounds, they've got diverse Occupy, occupations, and we're considering them to be sort of our our seeing eye dogs almost to to you know if if it resonates with them. Um, the anticipation is that they'll kind of help us like oh yeah well you know I'm creative director in this department but you know who could really use this is the you know, creative director in that department, or, hey, I'm freelance, and I've been working in public transportation, and off to the side, I uh, consult in the music industry. Let's see if we can kind of pass this thing around there. So much like 
a lot of great products. We really want to kind of tap into that, to building a community uh, to find out what's relevant and then seeing how we can go beyond that community. Now, from a, from a product and content perspective, we do got some pieces that are like buttoned in to the actual time that we'll spend with people. Uh, we, there's, a, there's a takeaway, like a physical object that we'll leave folks with. And there's a challenge for them to sort of uh, complete inside of this physical object and then send us some feedback. So there's your UGC piece as they, you know, kind of finish their, their, uh, their challenge and send us some, some uh, content back and we'll be able to use that and also kind of has some CRM baked in with some rewards based on how they move through the follow-up challenges. That just gave me a great idea for marketers. It's uh, brilliant too, to think about, you know, how you're taking everyone through the journey and what can you do on that thank you page? Or like, what can you do with the follow-up survey? And, ah, you guys are spot on. Love it. And and just, I will go this, I'm going to make sure I mention this on every single podcast that I have an opportunity on the thank you marketing people we all know there's all this stuff about how we're mapping how we're getting attribution what channels work on the thank you just put a check box where did you first hear about us and put all the mediums mm. so you can grade the mediums trust me there's a lot of fancy things you can do but that check box is very powerful when they tell you what medium they're you using and if one's 90 percent and the other's 10 percent, it'll help guide you what direction to take it so good. So good. All right, Josh. Gotta gotta put the gotta put the medium box. Oh, the box. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I thank you. There's a whole story behind it. So I got I'll I'll derail us just for, for 30 seconds good. here. Story behind that for me. So 2016 um or 2017 marketing, a little bit of like the attribution stuff is in play. Like, you know, we, we got Google Analytics, it's we're on Facebook, you know, Facebook spending and just like the whole game back then was probably like one tenth of what it is now, if even that. So I was doing marketing for a furniture store. And uh, that's what I brought up, because if I post a picture of this nice, luxurious mattress, somebody is not likely to go rage purchase that online. They're likely going to come into the store, look at it, try it out, you know, so you know, the, I was getting asked a lot is, well, how do we get attribution for the platforms? And I just said, just ask, <laughs> like, just talk to your customers, just ask when they purchase it, put it on the thing they're filling out, check a box. Where did you hear us? Every time they check Facebook, you can assist the conversion to it. So I'm like really, really passionate about that discussion because I think that we just really overthink it a lot of times. Mm. So that that's a way that I like to track things. I have to show you guys, um, Marcus, when you when you said, all right, Josh, you got this. I literally have this on my post-it note here. So we're going to add it to the list here of where did you hear about idea science yes. as we bring this to life? So it's committed. I love it. Attribution, baby. Yeah. Attribution. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Let's talk about programs, products in both of your past. So idea science is new, but I know both of you have done some incredible work in this marketing space, tell us what is the secret to, to really building something like this? Like I, I've never built a product. I've built a, a marketing campaign. Um, I selfishly like looking at this, like, I'm like, that would be really cool to do. Like, I would love to say that I've poured my passion into a project like this, but what, what is it that gives you that ability to build something like this? I want to I want to brag on I want to brag on Josh really quickly and and something that I think is his superpower that has you know really brought helped to bring us to this point and it's his capacity for and commitment to testing things and so we all we all know the story about how Jerry Seinfeld and uh, folks like Chris Rock are like constantly testing their material in like these local joints right like they may go out and tell a joke 50 times before it takes up 50 seconds in an hbo special right and one thing that i've seen for josh is he's testing for desirability constantly so that naive melody 
story that was talked about, like that was really delivered in a way where it was, it was up for, it was up, you know, to go on the chopping block. Right. And it, he wasn't. So when I wit witnessed it in the room, a part of how brilliant the, the concept was and how it connected to the science was how he delivered it. Right. Like he, he there was sort of this detachment and this observation to see how did that go over? And then I've seen him move it at different spots and kind of play with the timing. And that inspired me to use it at different spots, play with the timing, play up certain things. And every time that that thing goes out, we're, we're getting feedback like, oh, I think I think there's something I think there's something here. And that has given us like extra energy units and some some real data to say, hey, let's 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 see what would happen if we just extend this and build more around it, put some structure around it. I really like this because so much of this conversation today, just we're going to have to talk about this afterwards, too, but it's it's kind of reminded me of some of my thought process when I was very young in my career, something that I've said um, in the last few years, is I feel like if you took first like four years of my career, it's Andy and radio making no money and just throwing things at the wall. But it actually was when I was at my creative peak. Like I was unstructured at times, like it wasn't built to where it is now. But now it almost feels like you get to this spot in your career, there's a little more to lose, you know, like for trying big ideas. So you don't do it as much. So I'm trying to get a little bit back to it. But I really like the idea of testing because that was something I did a Saturday, Sunday radio show. Saturday, it was in College Station. It usually was pregame before Aggie games. We had um, listenership on Saturdays that could rival our morning show. So it was actually a pretty poppin' show at times. Sunday, Sunday on radio is if you throw a you throw a, a rock um, at a wall and you might be the only one that hears it. It's not a high listenership day. So I would test all my segments on Sunday and we had a text line. I wanted to see what the reaction was to it because I would ask for things on there like it's like open-ended segments, see how they would react. If I liked the reaction, they would show up on my Saturday show. And I just wasn't afraid to do that. And I, and I love that type of thinking, but it's something that I feel like I've, I've gotten further and further away from. So I think it's just good to hear that again. I love your mechanism for measurement. Um, when we're trying things all the time, it's really easy for that st all these experiments to get scrambled and for us to lean solely on intuition to say like, how'd that go? Did that feel good or not? Um, one way that we've been measuring new bits, do they stick and what impact do they have? Um, came, comes to us from uh, the original inspiration is the book Sprint by Jake Knapp, who ran Google Ventures. There's an activity in there for testing prototypes called Art Gallery where you put your concepts on the wall. They should be articulated in a way where they're, they are, you can understand them on your own. You don't need someone over your shoulder guiding you through what it is. Um, and based on how they interpret what they're seeing, they'll put some energy units on the things that give them energy or put some questions or comments or concerns on post-it in post notes below. So we took inspiration from that method. Um, we heard a lot of our attendees say like, it's gonna be hard for us to replicate the magic of stoked. And our goal is how can we demystify the magic of stoked that teams are talking about? Um, so we took every moment of a two day program and put a visual representation and a short little post-it note next to it of what we did and how we did it. We used body movement to do this. We used um, neural activation exercises to like shake off the siesta vibes after lunch. All these little things that feel like, you know, awesome, we put literally on the board. Um, then we had everyone cast their energy units on the things that really landed and resonated with them. Um, we even had them cast a super vote, a three inch version of these little voting dots on the things that gave them the most energy. Um, and surprisingly, this naive melody bit got everyone's super vote. There was something about this little story that we weaved in on the fly based on a, a reaction or, or a pivot to programming um, that really, really landed. And it gave us something a little more than just gut or instinct. 
um, to say that that worked. Uh, so some having something to ch uh, just challenge the way that we're measuring, even these tiny little add-on um, experiments really helps us build our own confidence in uh, assessing our gut or our intuition. Oh, well, oh, go ahead, Jess. I, I was just going to say, I mean, this is, this is something that our, our marketers, our listeners absolutely need to hear because this is so applicable to what they're doing every day when they're creating this content and telling their stories. And, and I think it applies to all ages as well, because Andy, unlike you, I feel like coming from business school, coming, uh, you know, g gaining my marketing degree and going right into corporate America, I was more like of the mindset well, you know, I, I've just been taught that I, like, I can't fail. I I, I want to get A's in everything. I want to get, you know, I'm an A plus student. I, I can't fail. So like going into that setting, I was definitely more scared and, and quiet because I didn't want to make a mistake. So I, I feel like now a days I... I am definitely tapping into my creative energy and 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 really embracing that failure. But I'm now thinking about these uh, these kids and these students coming out of these institutions, and uh, you know how they may have a, a, a different feeling where, like, I you know I I can't be too creative or I I really can't say what I'm thinking because I don't want to make a mistake. And that that's uh, just I just want to kind of pick up on that, maybe to like, yes, and and push the confidence meter out there on this one. I think in, especially where content is now, it's almost imperative to take that mindset. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share an example um, in, in the music space. TikTok and Instagram reels have become an incredible place to really do this. And so what, what I've, I've worked on campaigns with artists where an artist will take a sound and put a, um, a you know, 30 second clip of the audio out there and test it. And there's a metric within Instagram that you can see, how did this content travel on the internet? Was it mostly engaged with my, my core audience, which I think is represented by like blue or like, is it mostly engaged by my followers? And then there's a white sort of way that the, the circle fills out that, that will tell you how much of that is people who don't follow you. And so based on the ratio to people following me versus people who are not following me, that that initial piece of content kind of gets back, then the artist can say, okay, well, it, it's not shareable if it's mostly people who are following me. So maybe I should move on from this song and kind of pull another one from the Rolodex up and see how that works. And if it does travel, if that first clip travels well, then it's like, OK, well, let me share a little bit more of that. Let me see. Well, now I can start to play with is, you know, OK, should I release this song? Should I film a video for it? And it's like you can totally save your budget. You can totally maximize your content doing that and it was so fun kind of seeing that seeing that play out and I think by looking at that it's all it can almost become fun it's like gamification to see as long as there's a, a a disconnection from the actual thing and sort of like a scientist's mindset of like hey I'm here to learn I think it could become fun and that's something too, you know, the world I see this from a lot, you know, with, with it's a lot of Gen Z now and it's coming into the social media field. Uh, they do come through uh, much more business like courses to what you're talking about, Jess, where they're, they're not, it, it really depends, I guess, on what style of social media you do, but it's not as much the style of like 2012 where we just threw everything at the wall. It's now more the style is, hey, this is just, this is corporate America. This is a paid game. Every cent counts. Like you gotta, gotta make it happen. And something that I've tried to teach a lot, you know, both when I managed um, people professionally and also consulted 
is that these platforms are perfect for testing. Like they'll let you know exactly what you're talking about, Marcus, real quick what message works and doesn't work. So don't get married to any certain creative scheme, message, whatever it may be. Use those platforms to learn what it could be. And then if you take that time just to breathe, just to stop, just to learn, it could set all the dominoes for you to your advantage down the line. Oh, Josh, we have you muted. You're muted. I didn't yeah, know. yeah. Thanks, Andy. Um, I did that to myself. Um, this makes me think of a shout out I want to give to my friend Vicky. Um, she's a YouTuber. And uh, she really welcomed me interrogating her on all things, the life of a YouTuber and how she learns what's working, what isn't. Um, and she admitted the things that she think are going to crush, never crush. The things that she just went out there, put something together quick, something weird, and just threw it out there without a ton of thought are the things that um, inevitably are the breakthrough solutions. Um, and it just goes to show what, what I appreciate is her humility to admit, I never get it right. Um, and having tools to be able to measure at such a great, at such a speed and velocity and tight learning loops um, is such an, a, an amazing tool to be able to, to challenge what your, your intuition is and what I thought would be great versus um, what's really landing. So Vicky, I love thank it. you for awesome. It's great advice. The, we could go on on and on with this. It's a, a wonderful conversation. I got one last question uh, before we wrap up for both you, Josh and, and Marcus. You know, both of you um, have been executive coaches, Stanford D School. Um, you've done it for, you know, a handful of years. So we've talked a lot about changes in the industry and learnings. It's probably kind of take us to a little bit of a different place. But I'm, I was really curious when we started putting questions together from, you know, mid 2010s to now, what are some changes you're seeing with people and how they're approaching creativity in their daily lives? Have you seen this change considerably in your coaching experiences? I got one for us. Um, okay, this is the, the teams that we're working with, we're working with executives from all over the world. A lot of them are like director level, VP level folks. And the biggest shift that I've seen is their bosses expect creativity from them. Uh, the thing that is maybe the most surprising is they don't often realize it um, because the way that their leaders, th their leaders don't know how to ask for it. Um, they say, hey, go do bold, wild stuff, test it, break things, um, and let's figure out what is going to work so that we can scale it. Um, but a lot of senior executives aren't equipped with that language to be able to tell their team, go break stuff when it's cheap and, and easy um, so that we can succeed sooner. So I think the freedom that leaders have um, to go be boldly creative is much greater now than it was in 2015. Um, but I still think what remains the same is the, the senior leaders who are asking for it haven't found the right words um, to offer their, their leaders to really unlock that creativity or create a safety for them to go explore. I love it. That's a, a great advice right there, Josh. I think what we really hit on today, I think we covered so many just demographics uh, of seniorities of people that work in these different fields. And, you know, I, I'm just sitting here thinking idea science and how many people this could be right for. So I will be definitely looking at this for, for the launch. Follow on Stoked uh, to, to see when idea science drops and also be sure Josh Ruff, Marcus Hollinger, follow them. Um, you guys on LinkedIn both post great stuff. Happy to have you both. Happy to see you again, Marcus. Um, a lot of knowledge and a lot of learnings for us both. So thank you so, so much for both you joining today. So Marcus, we need to add Andy's name to this list. Where did you hear about idea science? 
Andy's going to be one of those checkbox items. Thank you, my friend. Perfect. Thank you, guys. All righty. Take it easy. Thanks. Well, just another wonderful conversation today. I had a great time talking to, to both of them. And really, I think out of a lot of our sessions, this one was unique because we we almost like removed success metrics from everything, right? What works, you know, creatively, creatively for both of them, but what works for others just to open up and talk about it. So I felt like this was a, 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 a real eye-opening approach, but a lot of it too, I feel like takes certain skills that people do have in their arsenal and they've used before when they've tried to find this. It's just, it's almost like a reminder that it's there. Yes. It's, it's taking it one step further for the skeptical. Like when you're saying eye-opening, I, I always think about some of the responses that I get when I tell people you are creative. So like, don't tell me that you're not creative because you are not an artist or you're not a designer. You, you actually are. We all have this innate ability. And then, you know, I get some smiles, some smirks, some eye rolls. Mm -hmm. So this idea science from Stoked is really, t really like pushing, pushing the limits and like, again, demystifying these stereotypes and taking it further and saying like, actually this is the science behind it. And this is, this is how you are. Yeah. The way that and, you are. And I think it's just good to discuss it because you're talking about, I'd love to talk more just about your business world, you know, coming into the corporate world that it's, it's interesting because you work at some of the highest levels of marketing. You're doing some high stakes stuff. And it's very important impacts return on investment quite a bit. Um, and there's so many areas where I feel like you actually budget wise in the corporate world have a lot more flexibility to test, but we almost feel like we can't, you know, it's a, it's a weird thing. And then I see it vice versa. Sometimes I see some of these, you know, real small places, they feel like all they can do is test because they're just, they're just trying things. And, and there's gotta be some sort of middle ground there. And I don't know if all of us have fully found it. Again, and this is where the idea science program could really be beneficial for, for these uh, teams, all different size teams, but especially for some of these corporate teams where, like you said, the budget may be there, but we have these preconceived notions, we have these fears where, you know, we're told that you, you have to make it happen, but you can't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to make mistakes. Our, our world <laughs> just is changing too quickly for anybody yeah. not to make a mistake. Yeah. Like we're talking like AI coming down the pipe. There's going to be a lot of mistakes, Jess. <laughs> like, like we talk chat GPT, we talk AI, we talk about all these fancy programs. We talk about using these to make new creatives. There's going to be, marketers have to brace. There's going to be a lot of mistakes when we start doing this. But if you try something new, you have to be open to it. Absolutely. That's why it, it's it's so inspiring to hear Josh's perspective around, you know, the C-suite, the executive levels, and looking at how their mindset is changing around uh, creativity and the fact that they're going to their senior leaders and now saying, yes, make those mistakes, be bold. We we need to get to that new territory. We we need to have an innovative mindset in order to adapt and uh, continue to grow our business. Yeah. And it just, it gets you out of the, you know, just monotony of, hey, this is our product and, and go. I mean, I think one of the best examples right now, and I'd love to maybe down the line, if we could get a guest from there, it might, it might be a tall ask, we could start pinging, but I would love to look at McDonald's marketing right now. Are you familiar with the Grimace campaign that they've been doing? I have absolutely heard of it. I've seen uh, I've seen uh, vloggers make the grimace shakes on YouTube. It's no, purple. It, it, I, so, I, I get that. I got that. <laughs> so the vibe I got from it, I could be wrong. This is just me analyzing from the outside looking in. They did a grimace takeover on social media. So McDonald's was just posting as grimace, and in whatever weird language grimace speaks it's it's very different but it's fun like whatever how you think grimace would talk is how they're talking on social media and it's hilarious it got tons and tons of engagement then it turned into like nostalgic pictures of grimace then it turned into 
um, like UGC content. Then it turned into this Grimace shake, which I don't think was reinventing the wheel. It was making a shake purple. And it's just like, all of this felt so low lift and it turned into this huge thing. And, and I saw something, I, I'm going to misquote this because I don't have the link up right now, but I saw something around the notion that McDonald's sales were up like eight to 10% following this so again this is like an idea like i feel like you could almost just test it in one day just to do the takeover see if people enjoy it or not turn it it becomes paid ads it becomes a new product it becomes this huge thing and it actually in my opinion takes less effort to try something like this versus doing a bunch of super high production videos and taglines and trying out 50 different hashtags like let's just try something and there's really no loss like they have enough brand power as long as they don't blow up their brand in a day like if it doesn't work it doesn't work if it works great so i i really appreciate to see a big brand try something like that yes absolutely i i think we can get someone from mcdonald's marketing team to tell us more about the strategy and the ideas behind it my guess i'm totally making an assumption here is they didn't do their customer surveys and people were saying oh we miss grimace it, it's more around they they found a, a a feeling or they 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 discovered someone saying something about how McDonald's makes them feel. And then it plays into like what's happening into the world right now. And the, the nostalgia uh, marketing piece, which we've talked about uh, on previous episodes. And, and that's something too. That's a whole other angle. Barbie just surpassed The Dark Knight as the highest grossing uh, movie. I think it was Warner Brothers. Could be wrong on that. I think it's Warner Brothers. Uh, but it's just nostalgia is this all over to play super mario brothers movie you, you're seeing it pop up quite a bit and you know what a better way to test than, than how they did that with grimace you know personally if they were to keep this going i would love if they did a hamburger version of this like i, I feel like they have to be like well, why not double down on this thing and have hamburger month Yes, they could do all of the characters. I mean, this yep. this would be a a smart move. Yes. Or at least a, a smart test. Yes. Now, I would love to see that. Um, one more thing you hit on that um, you did a LinkedIn post uh, that kind of reminded me as we we're, we're going through here. Um, you talked about yesterday about knowing how to talk to your target demo and talked about your two-year-old daughter and, and how you, you did that. But messaging is so important. And I feel like we're talking to uh, Josh and Marcus today. I feel like they really have their messaging down on what they're trying to achieve with everything they do. Now, messaging is a big thing. Like, you know, we have internal messaging, like, you know, LinkedIn, we have acronyms we use, things we know, but if we took it to the field, it wouldn't be as relatable. So I think that's something too that, you know, as we go into these creative sessions, how are you relating exactly with your audience with the message you're putting out there? Mm -hmm. Yes. And it can be, it can be the lingo and, and just like what I said yesterday, just asking that question, a very simple question, like, why did you say no? Or like, when, when was the last time you say, said no? And, and why? Like, yeah. to, you know, tell us more. And it's, just, and you can do that from a sales team perspective. So you can go to your sales team, or uh, if you have direct access to your customer, go directly to them and ask them for yeah. these stories. And nobody will tell you more truthful than a customer will. <laughs> like if you just ask, and sometimes they just want to be asked, like just ask, you know, that, that's the easiest way to do it. But uh, another great topic today, Jess. Uh, so next week, something we'll be gearing up for is we will have a CEO of a digital marketing agency. I, I'm geeked out for this one because coming from the agency world, I kind of know like what goes through the mind of a, a senior leader at an agency. I don't know if I fully know. I can't wait to dive deeper into this. So I think it'll be another fascinating discussion. Oh, I can't wait. Yes. I, you know, I could talk about this all day long. We could have had Josh and Marcus on for another five hours, but yes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue this conversation. Let's, let's talk more about creativity and demystify yes. it for for our listeners. 
Most definitely. But thank you again, Making of a Marketer. If you're a first-time listener, long-time listener, thank you as always. Uh, Marketing Podcast Network, where to catch us, uh, LinkedIn Live, if you'd like to see our faces on video and change <laughs> it up. Uh, but we'll be back uh, next Wednesday. So we'll see you then. Sounds good. Thanks, Andy. Bye, everyone.